This is the Linguistics Podcast. Questions or comments can be directed to Twitter at Linguist Chris or on WordPress, http colon slash slash linguistchris.wordpress.com. Hello and welcome to the Linguistics Podcast. My name is Chris and today we're going to be talking about linguistic typology. My coverage here of typology will be quite brief. Um, it's another sort of large subfield of linguistics um, that's focused more on the anthropological side than the theoretical side, but it's still uh, certainly an important area of study and one that I will be covering different aspects of in later episodes. Um, but today I'm just looking to sort of introduce the concept and kind of get everybody thinking in that direction um, because my next two or three episodes will deal directly with this. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank those of you who have uh, left comments or questions on my Twitter, at Linguist Chris. Um, that's been great. I, I want to give a quick apology out to you guys because I didn't check my Twitter for a little over a week, so um, I kind of dropped the ball on that and getting back to you guys. But um, I also want, want to introduce that I have, uh, I've got an email now, so it's linguistchris at gmail.com. Um, and that is a way for you guys to get in touch with me and have more than 140 characters at a, th at a time. Um, I should also mention that my WordPress that is in the intro to this show, um, I've realized my, my original model for the show um, was flawed. So what originally I was going to do is have a WordPress post per episode that showed uh, more in-depth notation and things uh, for the things that I went over in each episode. And then you'd be able to comment on the WordPress if you had questions about the actual content of the show. Um, and I didn't really keep up with that. Um, I, I never made more in-depth notes for any episode. Uh, and so that sort of fell through. So now I'm essentially replacing the, the WordPress aspect with just an email address where you can contact me with questions or comments. Um, and of course, Twitter will still be the quickest way to get in contact with me. And I do promise you all out there that I will check it more often. All right. Uh, okay, so... Uh, without further ado, let's get into linguistic typology. So what is linguistic typology in a nutshell? Um, and basically, typology is exactly what it sounds like. If you hear typology, the study of types, maybe, uh, you're not far off. It's a comparison between different types of languages uh, around the world. So uh, one other way it's been described is cross-linguistic study. Cross-linguistic meaning across languages. Okay, so typology is looking at different languages, looking at their features, what features they share, what features are different between languages, okay? And these features, uh, you know, feature itself is a sort of abstract concept, and it can, can be a broad feature, a narrow feature. Um, you can also look at properties of languages, so things like word order um, are, are, are commonly studied in linguistic typology, all these kinds of ideas. And, and you can go very much in-depth with linguistic typology. You really, uh, there, there's no upper bound of what you can study across languages. And uh, linguistic diversity um, is a typological issue that is has really come to the forefront again um, in linguistics at, that's looking just at how different languages are and, and the massive differences that you sometimes see. And this is interesting uh, for a reason that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, let's uh, go back to just the basics of, of typology. So in typological studies, uh, you often group languages by feature, like I said, um, and what's of most interest to typologists are languages which share entire groups of features and which of those features seem to be around in every language. So I already talked about diversity, but there are some features that all languages seem to share. And of course, that's of equal interest to typologists. Um, so let's really quickly get into uh, what it means when a feature is shared by all languages. Now, these uh, unique sets of features are called linguistic universals. Uh, that's often what they're called, and sometimes um, that is a, is a controversial name for them. Um, and that's one of the things I'll be getting to in the next episode. Um, but this idea of the linguistic universal uh, really has its roots back in, well, especially the late 50s, but even before. Uh, but the, the figure, when you hear about uh, linguistic universals, the figure that most comes to mind is a, a fellow named Joseph Greenberg, who made a list of these universals um, really quite a long time ago. Um, he, he comes to mind certainly from the typological standpoint, but even uh, slightly before him, there is uh, uh, perhaps the most famous linguist of all time, Noam Chomsky, comes to mind when you hear about linguistic universals. Perhaps not when everybody hears about it, but when I do, uh, he's the first one that comes to mind because he was uh, sort of the first to lay the groundwork for this idea of universal grammar. Okay, And these uh, universal grammars is very much entwined 
with the idea of linguistic universals uh, for some specific reasons. Okay, the two end up coming up together in conversation very commonly. Um, so, what is uh, this idea of universal grammar? Well, let me explain. In 1957, Noam Chomsky uh, released a book called Syntactic Structures, and this was a book that showed how language could be examined as a study of itself, uh, as a, st a, a, a systematic study. Uh, uh, you could study how the language uh, fit together, how words fit together to form sentences, um, and you could look for patterning in the way that words could could f go together. And if if you listen to the the syntax episode of this podcast, you know um, different. Uh, ways that words can go together, noun phrases plus verb phrases, for example, in English is, is a fairly common, simplistic sort of rule. And Chomsky was one of the first to, to look at this and, and show that this uh, held true, that you could, you could look at sentences and different utterances and you could examine the limits of what was possible in a language by looking at its syntax and so on and so forth. Um, Chomsky, uh, as it turns out, he um, became very interested in acquisition, how children could learn language uh, seemingly without much effort. Um, and one of the things that he, he uh, uh, popularized was the notion of the poverty of the stimulus. The poverty of the stimulus means that children seem to be able to acquire language without having adequate input. So we never sit down and, and explain to a child how to speak. We never give them these rules of syntax that Chomsky pointed out. We never give them the rules of morphology, the rules of phonology. Um, we simply talk around them, and, and for that matter, we don't say uh, that much around them in, in terms of, of picking what we say to try and teach the child the most as possible. We don't do that. We simply just talk around, and they seem to sort of absorb language in a way that is difficult to explain, and this is the poverty of the stimulus. You can't guarantee that uh, you have exhausted all possible syntactic structures in your everyday speech around your child, and uh, likewise, the child will come up with utterances that he or she has never heard, uh, and they will they will come up with them uh, just naturally in the course of human events. And so this is the poverty of the stimulus argument, and why Noam Chomsky introduced something called the LAD, the Language Acquisition Device. And this is a theoretical mental device that all humans have, which allows them to quickly... Uh, and in a principled way, acquire language. Not learn language, but acquire it. Um, and this is intertwined with uh, ideas like a critical language learning period, things like this. Uh, I, I realize we haven't gone over language acquisition yet in this podcast, and we will in a future episode. Um, but basically why I'm introducing this here is because um, Chomsky's uh, uh, theory for the language acquisition device is, is very much entwined with this idea of universal grammar. And what universal grammar is is a set of innate linguistic structures, innate meaning you're born with them, innate linguistic structures uh, in your mind that are, are sort of placeholders for expected uh, rules or expected structures. Okay, things that a lot of languages seem to share. Okay, so when you're learning um, English, for example, and, and we know that English has a very fixed uh, word order, and one of the features of English is that the subject comes before the object in English. Um, so an early version of the Chomskyan uh, theory would say that uh, having the subject before object is a parameter that can be um, uh, turned on or off uh, in the, the child's brain by just hearing a single utterance uh, in which the subject is before the object. Right. Um, this is the idea of universal grammar. So um, these parameters, and I should mention this this particular theory that I'm talking about right now is the principles and parameters uh, theory, which is uh, related to universal grammar and was one of Chomsky's theories in the in the mid '80s, I believe. Um, you could you the child would simply hear what he or she needed to set these the set of parameters, and the set of parameters was a set of um, features or binary relations between features. So having subject before object or object before subject, that's uh, there's only two possibilities there. Um, these parameters were innate in the brain of a child, and they would be switched one way or another based on very little input. Okay, um, this is quite a claim, certainly. Um, but you see how this fits into the idea of typology, because if you had features that were shared between all languages, certainly these would be features which had parameters in the language acquisition device. 
Okay, so that's why that's how these things fit together. Um, so linguistic universals are not only important in looking at similarities between languages, but if you're a Chomskyan, if you follow this sort of idea of universal grammar, um, they're crucial for sort of defining what is in universal grammar. Uh, the, the items that are in universal grammar should be present in every language, and the way you figure out what those are is typological study. Okay. Um, now let me mention briefly uh, this idea of Chomsky's, especially principles and parameters, uh, has been has been sort of uh, heavily disputed over the years, and it's not the current version of the theory. Uh, the current version, I believe, unless he's got a more current one, is called the minimalist program. They call it the minimalist program because the list of items within universal grammar keeps getting smaller and smaller, and and Chomsky having to define what's in universal grammar. Is there a universal grammar? Uh, they keep being able to use less and less things. Because typologists continue to show the the massive amount of diversity across languages, and the idea, well, uh, Steven Pinker, who is who is a a, a very uh, he's got a lot of popular press. He has he has many books um, that are written for sort of the everyman um, and very famous linguist at that. He uh, said something to the effect, and this is not an exact quote. I'm paraphrasing here, but something to the effect that if a Martian uh, were to to come to Earth tomorrow, uh, they would they would certainly conclude that all humans, uh, with 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 disregard for a few subtle differences, all humans speak the same language. And of course, this is alluding to Chomsky's theory that all languages are essentially the same. No matter where you go in the world, you'll find all these different languages which share pretty much the same features. And these features are in universal grammar. Well, that's heavily disputed now by typologists. Um, and indeed, the pendulum has started to swing the other way, where a lot of typologists uh, are saying we really see a lot more difference than we do similarity, and and the similarities um, that we can we can put a finger on are uh, becoming fewer and fewer uh, with every uh, massive study that is that is carried out. Um, all right, so what kind of things? Um, are specifically of interest in typology. Well, one, which I said uh, earlier, is word order. Um, so if you think about English, English is primarily associated with uh, an SVO word order, that's subject, verb, object. Um, other languages, it's been argued, have, have different word orders. Um, so an, another very common one is, is uh, SOV, subject, object, verb. Um, Japanese, it's been argued, is, is, is one of these types of languages. Um, where the subject comes first, then the object, and then the verb at the end. Um, in fact, SOV is supposedly the world's most common word order across languages. Um, and this is something that really strikes a lot of people the first time they hear it, that uh, English uh, is not indicative of most of the world's languages in terms of how it works. And in fact, it's not. English is sort of an oddball in, in many areas. And in a future podcast, I'll go over uh, exactly what's strange about English and what's unique about English and why speakers of other languages tend to have trouble with some aspects of English. Um, but yeah, so word order um, is something that's very commonly studied uh, in typological linguistics. Now, I should mention that sometimes saying word order uh, will anger some typologists, um, and this is another reason why it's a field that's sort of uh, shrouded in, in, in this sort of aura of... Um, discrepancy, uh, where, where people will argue one way or another on a, on a huge variety of different issues in typology. Uh, when you say word order, uh, like SOV, subject, object, verb, and you say, well, Japanese seems to be pretty much an SOV language, which if in many books that are published, you'll, you'll read that, um, it's, it's, it can be disputed because Japanese actually has a fairly free word order. In fact, as long as the verb comes at the end in a Japanese clause, because of the way that Japanese marks for case, a nominative, accusative uh, case, um, you know what the subject and the object is without need for an order other than the verb. So you could have a sentence in Japanese that is OVS, or I'm sorry, OSV, as, with the verb at the end, uh, and it's still perfectly acceptable. Um, and so you can see how it, it gets sort of squirrely really quick if you want to make a, a claim like, oh, Japanese is SOV. And even English, if you want to say English is SVO, 
Um, there's certainly some way, albeit albeit sort of archaic ways in English that you can that you can say, uh, no, this this is not always the case. Uh, there's there's certainly some variation between that, and especially uh, with languages like German, for example, which uh, the basic German word order is is also oftentimes claimed to be S V O like English, um, but if you know anything about German, German is really what's called a verb second language. So uh, the the uh, some verb be main or auxiliary needs to come second in German, and uh, if you have sort of a an extended clause at the end, then the verb comes at the end of the sentence, or you can you can even stack two verbs, three verbs at the end of the sentence in German as long as there's one in the second position. Um, and just from this little sampling, you can see that there's quite a lot to look at when you're trying to compare languages. Um, just by looking at word order alone, even if we accept that um, uh, Japanese is SOV and English is SVO, um, that's a massive difference. And uh, certainly it's, it's quite easy to find differences across languages. And uh, like I said, the number of similarities is decreasing. Okay, so specific issues in language typology, I will go into more later just to give you guys uh, some examples real quick. Um, word order I already mentioned. Phonemic inventories, so what, what phonemes are used by each language. Um, what type of language is a language? So some, sometimes um, uh, you'll hear things like uh, Mandarin Chinese is an isolating language, or Turkish is an agglutinating language. Well, what does that mean? Um, that's certainly something I'll go over in the next episode or the next episode after that. Um, another thing that's interesting that I'm seeing more and more in typological study is uh, semantic distinctions. Um, so uh, there, there's a common myth, and this is a myth, by the way, that uh, Intuit Eskimo has 20-something words for snow. Well, as it turns out, that's not true. Um, but it gives you a, a, a good sort of idea of what it means to have a semantic distinction. If there were a language which had 20-something words for snow and English has, I don't know, say four or five, um, that language which had 20-something would be making finer distinctions about something than another language. Um, and that, it can happen. In, in, in the case of Intuit with, with snow, it's not the truth. Uh, but it can happen in some cases. Now, crucially, we're not saying that you can't say all the same things about snow in English versus, you know, language Y. Um, but uh, there are differences in, in lexicon and semantic distinctions that are made just by basic words uh, in some languages over others, and that's another thing that's heavily studied. Okay? All right, so I would uh, like to thank you, as always, for listening to this episode of the Linguistics Podcast. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, I'm going to end with a, a slightly different outro here. So uh, you can you can contact me with questions or comments at, on Twitter, at LinguistChris, or uh, LinguistChris at gmail.com, and we'll just pretend that I never had a WordPress. And in the next episode or the episode after that, uh, I will change the intro to reflect that. All right? Thanks again.